Ann Coulter is coming on in the uh, next segment of the show, so we want to make sure that uh, we are ready for that. We're going to let her weigh in on not just the debate, but all the other crap that's going on, <laughs> because one thing about Ann is uh, she will find the humor in it all. She will also take some shots at the president and the wall, although he said last night there's a lot of wall going up, and somebody told me that they've seen quite a bit of wall and not just repairs uh, on the border, so we're going to see if Ann has heard these things and if she is willing to accept that we will be getting the wall. I wonder if Ann ever dated Dennis Rodman. No, probably not. She did date uh, Bill Maher, though. That'd be a it's unique just couple. couple. <laughs> Ann and Dennis? She dated uh, Jimmy, uh, what's his name? Jimmy who? Uh, they was in that show Good Times. Oh, yeah, Mr. Dynamite. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's all I know him as, Dynamite. Yeah, that guy. All right, let's take Jimmy a Walker? break now. Is Jimmy Walker, Walker, that's who it was, yeah. I think uh, Ann dated him. She almost married uh, Dinesh D'Souza. Probably should have. Part of President's campaign, you know, President Trump's campaign promise to build a wall along the southern border in San Diego, 14 miles has been built. So we're going to see whether my my good friend, the amazing, the brilliant Ann Coulter, accepts this uh, 14 miles out of the 18 (laughs) miles that has been built. Hi, Ann. How you doing? Fine, thanks. How are you? I'm fine. There's a there's a wall in San Diego that wasn't there before. Is there San Diego? I thought always had that wall. I thought they've been bragging about that same wall, and it's worked fabulously well. It's more it was more like two hundred miles. Well, there there was some wall, but this was an area that didn't have a wall, and now has a fourteen mile wall. You're sure there was no wall there before? I'm positive. And I mean, even like a little sawhorse. No, but not even. I said before, and by the way, I'm not, <laughs> not the even one, a I sawhorse. Did not raise the wall issue here. I'm keeping <laughs> calm now that, now that you know. <laughs> now that he's got bigger <laughs> battles. To throw him out of office unceremoniously because they think he's icky. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so I wouldn't have mentioned it, but but the reason I ask specifically that there was no wall there before is it it really does make a difference even when they're replacing you know just like and, and a lot of what they've done is there were just saw horses True. that used to be called the board right. and they built something that's a real fence they're fine okay it's tougher to get over there those not impossible but a little tougher with a fe- with a secondary 30 foot steel bollard barrier behind that well, that that is good, but the yes. reason you want it where there has been no wall, nothing, 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 is it shows <laughs> that it can be done in that area. The EPA lawsuits are over. The right. Native American lawsuits are over. The private property owners have either, you know, invited them in with open arms or, or you know, all the bureaucratic hassles have gotten through, whereas to merely improve something that was already there, even the, the sawhorse thing, um, doesn't take as much, you know, bureaucratic wrangling. That's why it does make a difference. So that is good news. And, what well, we only have about 2,500 <laughs> miles to go. <laughs> That's it. But at least we, we, we got to start, you know. You got to start somewhere. We know that. Anyway. Yeah, and it shows that he knows what he ran on. And I'll <laughs> tell you one other thing that has perked me up recently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that is, as I probably said to you before, um, um, you know, stop, stop, you know, singing his praises when we need to put pressure on him now. This is when we hold his feet to the fire. Um, we only have 13 months left because um, either, he, either he gets voted out of office or um, in his second term is, you know, when he doesn't have to fear re-election, well, then we have nothing to pressure him with. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is why I'm now, I'm now not worried about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really happy about this impeachment stuff. The Democrats, the media are so insane. They want this monster out of their sight. They will never stop. Um, so even though we won't have to face re-election in the second term, it, he will certainly be facing endless impeachment hearings as he has term one. Yeah. Well, okay. So he will still have, you know, leverage to pressure him to keep his promises. Mm-hmm. And if he keeps his promise and builds a wall along the border, 
Donald Trump will go down as America's greatest president. Yeah, well, and he, he's, he's staking that claim. I heard him say it a few times last night. Don't you find it am- amazing, though? Because, you know, we know a lot of people in the media. You hang out with a lot more liberal media people than I do, but we know them. <laughs> and- something you constantly <laughs> bash me for, but go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, you know, because it's so... I, I just want to be there one day when you're having lunch with Allison, you know, because it would be worth the price of admission. But I'm, 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 you know, I'm looking at them, and I, I find it hard to believe that they really don't see what's going on. That they can block out the rallies where you have fifty thousand people show up after he's been attacked nonstop for three years. Do they not understand the dynamic at all? That's a really good point, and and you're absolutely right. They are in a bubble. Um, I mean, even before before. Trump came along. I mean, when Trump was coming along, the, the the conditions that led to Trump coming along, how all of them, Republicans, Democrats, the media, are so, so, so out of touch with what people want. I mean, why was it that two days after he announced, um, I was on Bill Maher's show real time saying that Trump was the most likely Republican to get the nomination? I didn't even like him then. I thought he was a tacky vulgarian. But I heard him give that Mexican rapist speech, as I fondly call it, and he did not call all Mexicans rapists. Um, and, <laughs> and like you, I knew this is what we've been waiting for. Exactly. We've been facing these Rubios and McCains and Flakes to say nothing of the Democrats right. um, who are liars and pretended to care about immigration. They are so completely out of touch, and nothing shows it more than the immigration issue. This is something Pat Goodell, the great pollster, Democratic pollster, um, Uber, Uber wonder child pollster. He was a pollster for a presidential candidate when he was still an undergraduate at Harvard. Right. In any event, he was, he was very good at sensing the will of the American people. And he said, on no other issue, um, do you see the elites? I forget what he called them. I hate calling them elites because, as we all know, they're not elites right. in any normal sense of the word. But, you know, the, the political class. Mm-hmm. The political class is so separated from what the voters want as on immigration. Yep. And, and one thing I've noticed, um, a, a tribute to you and, and um, you in particular, so way more than the rest, but radio hosts versus TV hosts. Mm-hmm. Radio hosts are always quicker um, to get the mood of the country. They are, they are much better at gauging the mood of the country because they have callers. I think that has a lot to do with it. They're taking calls from, you know, t- truck drivers at 2 a.m. and regular people. You don't get any contact with people in a TV studio. You are, it is the, the ivory tower mm-hmm. um, with all, you know, people serving you and the makeup artists. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. It sounds like a great life. But you're sitting, you know, in your nice air-conditioned studio. You're not talking to, to average people, which is why, well, Fox News has been so far behind on the immigration issue. As you'll recall, they were throughout the campaign 2016. Remember Rupert Murdoch put in the order um, that met for Megyn Kelly to take out Trump in that first in that first debate, it was quoted in New York Magazine. Rupert Murdoch said, enough is enough, the first debate. Well, you know, I'm sorry, Australian immigrant, that our candidates don't please you. Right. Um, but they were totally against Trump, and, and, and the people that you and I can count, and you've been on the immigration issue for a long time, you're your, your, your gold star, um, <laughs> But the ones you can count who were on our side oh. around the time Trump came along, they're all talk radio hosts. Yeah. And me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 a couple of, and Mo Brooks. And Michelle so Malkin. You know, there's not right, a whole, whole right. lot of people who were able, who had the courage to withstand the beating that you get when this is your issue. I'm actually going to be in D.C. tomorrow talking exactly about that in a keynote. That, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, I jumped on this issue when I did. Um, just allowed the people in the country to contact me and speak to me. I don't n- take calls, but they write to me and they yeah. they constantly are in contact. They tell me every. I have one person who sends me every article anywhere in the world where an illegal immigrant is involved in a crime. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the, fantastic. 
nothing. Yeah, I mean, I she's obsessed. With that person. Yeah, she's obsessed. <laughs> and it, But it's fascinating because she never has a shortage of material. I get 10, yeah. 12 emails from her a day, Anne. And it put me in a, in a unique position to be hearing um, from the American people. You're absolutely right. You can sit in a, in a TV newsroom and you may get emails, but you don't even look at them. You don't answer them. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. And there really is, I mean, this is why, to go back to, you know, happy talk about Trump, this is what was so sort of weird and stunning about him, and I believe remains true to this day. He really does, <laughs> more than any politician I've ever seen, he knows in his gut what's popular and unpopular. He may hire idiots to tell him the wrong thing and talk him out of doing the right thing, um, but I feel like... I remember when, and and I'm sorry, but it's true, um, that turncoat Mitt Romney was the best on immigration in 2012. By a long shot, he was the best on immigration. Right. Ruben Murdoch came after him, too. Right. I don't know if you remember that, but told him, you got you got to stop this self-deportation business. Right. And Mitt said, no, no, this is, and then there was debate, I think it was a debate in Florida, in fact, where Newt Gingrich was bleeding about, we're not going to tear children from their grandmother's arms. My Mike Huckabee compared, we have to make up for the legacy of slavery yeah. by, by granting amnesty. Good grief. Right. That's, that's the field we were looking at. And, 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 and Romney came along and, and said self-deportation. Um, we liked but it. But then yep. Trump, of all people, to expect him to come and just instinctively understand this is what Americans care about. And we saw how the media class reacted and is still reacting, and the way the political class reacted and is still reacting. So his, his instincts, oh, I was going to say about Romney, one of my friends in L.A., hardcore conservative, you, like you, used to be a liberal. They're the best. Yeah, um, and we he are. said the reason he never trusted Romney, even though he admitted he was the best on, on immigration and the things we care about, he said with Ronald Reagan, you could walk in in the middle of the night, throw a glass of cold water on him, and ask him a political question, and he would instantly give you the right answer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We have to outspend the Soviet Union. Right. We, have to, we have to threaten them every place around the globe. We have to slash taxes. He would have instantly given you the right answer. Whereas you felt like with Romney, and this is the way you feel like with a lot of... Um, a lot of t TV hosts, to mm -hmm. the extent they eventually come around, they have to study what are my talking points. Ugh. Yeah. No. And well, that's the other candidate. It's not Trump. You can throw a glass of cold water on him in the middle of the night. Very poor on, on follow through. Right. Well, as I have mentioned over the past few years, but his instincts are in. Are, are amazingly good. And considering that he has been living in Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, it's it's wacky. It is. But, I, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I look at him, I looked at him at that rally last night, and his connectivity to the people, all 30, 50,000 of them, not, not just, you know, part of the audience, is mind-boggling. And the media just stands there, watches it, and doesn't get it. They call yeah. they they can't continue to think that everybody's a moron and a bobblehead. Or a racist. Yeah, or a racist. A yeah. If you want to, if you if you want a wall on your border, but don't care that much if there's a wall in Syria. <laughs> um, one thing I'll I'll say about him, and hopefully he's he's, um, this is both a compliment and a constructive criticism about. Um, the commander in chief, and that is while his instincts are very good, the one thing that started to worry me when he became president, um, besides the very poor follow through, is that uh, he is a bit of a narcissist, mm -hmm. and you, he can't be thinking that it's just for him, the person, him because he was on The Apprentice. He has to reflect back to 2015, 2016, what the chant was. Yeah, it's fun having a Republican who will fight back. It's fun having a Republican who will say wacky things that drive the media crazy. But what, what tethered us um, to this man with steel bonds what were his issues? It was what he was saying about immigration, about the wall, about dreamers, about deporting illegals and going after the immigration. About bringing soldiers the home. Rest of the world yeah. and not, not signing job-killing trade deals that are great for Wall Street and great for Washington, but are just wiping out the middle class mm -hmm. out in the middle part of the country. That's what bonds us to him. It's not the personality. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you're right, but I think what when he gets in touch with that is when he does these rallies, and I think he yes. needs to do a rally twice a week. <laughs> That's my yes. feeling. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. I wish he would fire the entire White House staff and just <laughs> just see what plays at the rallies. Yeah, because was... then he'd be fantastic. And and speaking of which, one of the things that I think plays very well, and it's an issue that they're hysterical about, oh, impeach, impeach, <laughs> um, and, and that's asking for favors from foreign leaders. I, I, I mean, you, I'll I'll defer to you as the talk radio host here, but my guess is you ask any American, okay, we're giving all these countries billions of dollars. Right. Is it okay for us to ask for something in return? Exactly. I want to know why Barack Obama didn't get anything for his one and a half billion dollars to the Iranians. No. Right. Maybe if right. he'd had a little more negotiating skill, we could have actually gotten some peace in the Middle East, but we didn't. And and he, he has a license. As far as Mick Mulvaney's comments yesterday, I saw nothing wrong with them. Um, I believe that every president should negotiate with anyone who takes money from the from the United States of America. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, for, for all kinds of things. None of them are personal in the sense of invest in the Trump power. Right. Um, what what liberals describe as a personal interest is something that's good for the country and consequently good for the current president. Right. I mean, as I wrote in a column a couple of weeks ago, I, I commended to you, there were far more political investigations conducted. Bill Clinton was investigating Rudy Giuliani That's because right. his wife was about to run for Senate against him. Mm -hmm. Investigating the New York, the gem of the Giuliani administration and the country. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the New York City police force, which is why I don't, I don't really watch that much TV anymore. But when I've seen Giuliani, he, he doesn't seem completely to be his old Giuliani. I don't care what he did ever. That is a man I will defend to, to the, the death. death. Me too. In my lifetime, and I think probably several lifetimes before me, I can't think of a government, a government official, a government policy that changed the world for the better so much. And it's, it's basically Ronald Reagan and Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, I have to agree. And on that note, I will let you go. But <laughs> I, I do agree. How are you doing? Everything else good? Um, well, the truth is I'm deeply depressed over the Yankees, but I hate when people bring personal things. Oh, no, no. I'm a, my son my son is virtually, uh, you know, he's on suicide watch over this Yankees <laughs> thing. The, the other night when they were winning, he was texting me every five minutes. I haven't heard from him since. It's <laughs> scary. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it was a bad few nights. Yeah, last night was bad. But that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll win the next one. It's, uh, it's still the Yankees. Take I'm care, Ann. Yankees. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, boy. Oh boy.